Welcome to episode 85 of Let's Talk Geek, recorded on Pi Day 2012. If you're an American, uh, that's 14th of March 2012. In today's show, we've got the co-creator of the MIME standard, Dr. Nathaniel Barnstein, chief scientist at MIMECast today. We've got sending free SMSs from your Google chat inside Gmail to MTN and ATA, and Apple's so-called 4G support on the new iPad. Thank you for watching and listening and streaming and downloading and liking. Welcome, everybody, to episode 85 of Let's Talk Geek, recorded on the illustrious night of March 14th, 2012. Why is it illustrious, I hear you ask? Okay, I know you didn't ask, but it's we, illustrious we anyway. They asked, we couldn't hear them. <laughs> it is Pi Day, if you're an American, uh, because they put the month in front of the day. So it's the third month and the 14th day, so it's 3 one, four. Like pi, 3.14. Yes. Oh. Yes. Oh. Yes. Okay. Oh. How, how, how. Yes. All right. So uh, there, there's a random There's a random for, for this show. In Greek numerals, pi has the value of 80 and epsilon has the value of 5. Okay. Pi like a so, pi has equals 80. Yes. yes. Not pi the mathematical N- the math- term. Co- constant. No, in Greek numerals. Like, okay. like Roman numerals. Pi happens so, to be the mathematical so, constant. So pi epsilon is 85. So show 85 pi epsilon. Anyway, which leads us <laughs> to today's event, pi, and why tau is better. Uh, degrees in radians is pi over 2. Pi divided by 2. Um, pi is 180 degrees. A half circle. And so, what the Talmudic trigonometry taught to us that, you know, that unwieldy. Uh, yeah, that unwieldy. Just have it that tau is the circumference, or is a whole, represents a whole circle, the, the degrees of a whole circle. So, instead of it being 180 degrees, it is now 360 degrees. So tau over 2 is a half circle as opposed to pi over 2, which is a quarter circle. <laughs> okay. and, and tau if, is superior if, in every if way. If this confused you, go, go, go look, um, search YouTube for Vi... Vi Hart. Vi, yeah, Vi Hart has released a YouTube video today as well. She always commemorates Pi Day. And so she's got a beautiful Shakespearean sonnet uh, this year uh, to, to talk about how you know, maybe Shakespeare's works are embedded within Pi. Um, but, uh, but she's got a previous video up as well. It'll be in the show notes, and I'm going to bomb it into the IRC now. Vi which Heart, is y- sorry? Vi, vi Heart. So V-I, v- yeah. like virtual intelligence. Heart, oh, like, like okay. a deer. Okay. One word. I'm going to bomb in the link into IRC as well on why Tau is better. Two more things that are happening today. It's Albert Einstein's birthday. And he would have been 133. And um, it is the origami master Akira Yoshisawa's birthday. He would have been 101 today. And that's commemorated by Google in its yes, Google Google okay. um, And for any other star dates, apparently, uh, go to stardates.co.za because it actually has been updated. I worked my fingers off today. But, yeah, there's quite a lot of things coming up. Um, there's one interesting one in April where there's going to be social media expo. There's going to be a mobile expo. And then third one, I can't recall now, all happening at Sa- uh, Santon Convention Center in the same three days. Wow. That actually looks interesting. So you can just, my, like, camp out at Santon Convention Center, bring a tent. Yeah. 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 So it looks very interesting. Should we just quickly introduce our guest. Yes, please do. Um, <laughs> we, are, we, we have the pleasure of having join us in the show today, Nathaniel Borenstein. Um, uh, Nathaniel, um, will you give us a quick introduction of yourself? Uh, sure. Uh, I'm the chief scientist at Mimecast, a London-based email services company. Uh, previously, I was a distinguished engineer at IBM and a serial entrepreneur, uh, founder of the first internet payment company, First Virtual. And then before that, uh, was what most people know before, which was I was one of the two co-authors of the Mime standard which turned 20 a few days ago. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, we've, we've actually got that in the, in the show notes. So uh, I'd, I'd love to talk a little bit more about mime. But I think before that, we have to deal with the elephant in the room. And that is... The pizzas. N- n- no, 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 not the pizzas. You, the, luckily, the audience can't smell these pizzas. Um, but that's the fact that the iPad has now been said to have 4G technology built in. 
Um, <laughs> yes, yes. So uh, I think before we proceed, we must first. <laughs> I think at some point we're just going to have to give up. I vote. You know, they're just going to have to go and redefine what 4G means. Well, it, it has been. I think marketers have ruined the term. Yes. So it, it no longer means what the ITU has, has said, said it to mean. Um, and, uh, but hold on, hold on. Is this marketing from iPad or is this the network? Apple. Apple. So now, Apple said now, now 4G. Now check this out. It is actually incredibly confusing because on the Apple website, when you click through, you know, learn about 4G, it goes – it. On the Apple website, it actually says HSPA, HSPA Plus, and dual carrier HSPA are 3G technologies, mm. not 4G. However, in the latest update of iOS 5.1, so if I take my iPhone now, go to the States, put an AT&T SIM on it, and I connect to an AT&T HSPA Plus network, it says 4G. So there's conflict even within Apple's own communication, uh, really. So, like, there really is no surety about what See, the 4G problem is. the whole statement is, why would you try and use your Apple phone in the States? Just use a phone that actually works. <laughs> Don't Especially be mean to my yeah, iPhone. No, no, you, you, you can. You which can. carrier? AT&T. It's the biggest carrier, my friend. Yeah, with the most complaints about coverage. Well, that's the same with Vodacom. It's because they're the biggest. Um, they well, probably want to talk about the Vodacom. Yeah. So, sorry, Nathaniel, Yes. I'm, I just, I'm not sure that's true. I thought that Verizon Wireless was actually bigger in the States. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, well, that, that's well, we valuable. Are, well, unfortunately, talking from South Africa, so <laughs> yeah, yeah. just what our impressions. Yeah. Um, as a point of interest, which carrier do you use? Well, in the States, I use Verizon Wireless <laughs> on an Android and or an Android on Verizon Wireless, I should say. Yes. Um, and in, in UK and Europe, I use an iPhone. We just switched from O2 to Vodacom, I think. Vodafone. Vodafone, um, yeah. Okay. And I don't have a strong opinion about carriers, um, but I can tell you that as a long-time Apple fan and Mac bigot and all of that, I prefer Android. There we go. <laughs> there we go. You're on the right oh, show tonight. <laughs> which, which phone do you have, uh, if we may ask? In the States, my yeah. Android phone is currently a, a Droid Incredible 2. Droid Incredible is an HTC. Is a, I think it's a rebranded HTC for Verizon, right? Yeah. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Uh, sorry, um, uh, we pa uh, myself and Tim are packing Androids, but for some reason, Jan's walking around with an iPhone. I just don't understand why. <laughs> I've, I've given my Galaxy Nexus. Uh, well, I'm going to give my. So I'm, I'm weaning myself off it. I'm going to give my Galaxy Nexus to one of the colleagues in the office to use to see if he's going to switch from BlackBerry. To Android. I think well, we've might. got to say the mixer is actually on a BlackBerry, and that's the only one in this country that actually works. <laughs> um, uh, more volume anyway, is a request from RC. We've got a question about the volume. Yes. Yeah, no, we, we, we're busy is sorting that out. Um, Nathaniel's. Nathaniel's Stop. volume. Um, we'll, we'll put up your volume, Nathaniel. Don't worry about it. But let's just come back about the carriers because you said, yeah, it's like Vodacom, the biggest carrier in the country. I know the story is much lower, but where is the major fail for Vodacom at the moment? You tell me. Let's talk about Google SMSs. <laughs> you want to skip the Google SMSs? Oh, why you, you brought up Vodacom. <laughs> come on. <laughs> All right, cool. So for those who, who, who might have missed the story, Google has finally brought Gmail or Google Chat SMS functionality to South Africa. Yay! This, is, this has been available as a labs add-on since 2008. We have just cracked the nod. Um, and only two of our networks are letting Google send SMSs to their phones. And that, of all people, is MTN and ATA. Um, so, and, and not the biggest biggest carrier in the country, Vodacom. Um, and so we obviously asked them, hey, listen, what Why on not? earth? Where are you? And, you know, two out of four carriers are there. Where is Cell C? Where is Vodacom? And they both said, we're investigating, blah, blah, blah. Oh, you know, some oh, Cell C yeah. users have reported that messages do get delivered despite receiving error messages. So I don't know if there's, some, if there's still some glitches that need to be sorted out. But from Google's side, officially support is MTN. And ATA. And I must say, it works like a charm. It works beautifully, hey? It's unbelievable. You stay in the same chat and you just keep on going. That person goes offline, switches to SMS mode, and they start getting SMSs. I'm like, okay, yeah. hold on. I message it your heart out. And, the, and they can reply back. Yes. And they can yeah. reply back, yeah. yes. Um, that is you want them to reply back because that's when you get your credits back. Yes. Yeah. So for, for those who want details on how – well, maybe we should just give details on Could how exactly it works. You get 50 credits. Those are 50, essentially 50 free SMSs to start with. For every message you receive, you get, you get five back. 
to a maximum of 50. So if you ever run low, say you've sent a whole bunch and, and now, you, now you need more. Um, so what Google has done is they, they go, if you ever hit zero, the next day you'll have one credit. So you're never locked out of the system. And then you can just send yourself messages. So this is the one limitation of the system. You have to, the, the person must have received a message from you from Google Chat before they can reply to you via SMS. So that's probably the one limitation over other SMS replacement services. So I don't initiate the chat from Gmail. Is they this, can't reply to me by Isn't SMS. that part of it just there's obviously some code that they send? And probably some well, sort of, sort of almost like a, like a network address translation yes. to cell phone numbers. Well, it's again, you, you, I don't know if you ever noticed, you get SMSs from numbers that's much longer than the 11 characters. I mean, yeah. it, and you get Exactly. These G G Talk SMSs that come through are much longer. So I'd love to somebody explain to me one day how what happens with those other numbers because that's got to be then the Just I don't know transaction IP some or something yeah. or, or number or whatever. Mm. But mm. yeah. So coming back, yeah. Thanks, Vodacom. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, I'm not with Vodacom. <laughs> so I've been playing with the SMSs the, the, the last two days unbelievably. <laughs> Cool. It's cool. Let's love it. So, so um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move topics around a little bit. I wanted to talk about um, MIME turning 20 on the 11th of March. So MIME is one of those standards where if you're not a nerd, and I don't mean geek, I mean nerd, you don't actually even really know about MIME because it's no. one of those standards that is so, it is so beautifully hidden by True. the applications that use it, you never know that you've done it. So for all of you who have sent me lolcats, to all of you who have sent me videos in email, um, uh, never mind. Even some when you go to web pages, some of that it's still based on that standard. on MIME types exactly. Yes. So and uh, and okay. Brief the, overview: What is MIME? The Android will just will ask Nathaniel in just a oh, second. You can ask we have the co-creator yes. of MIME okay. in the show. Right. And the person <laughs> who sent the first MIME message. Indeed. So um, and so uh, the the as the Android devs in the IRC will tell you. And MIME types are incredibly important regardless of what you're developing right now. So, and it's constantly something that's being added to. When a new file type, when a new file type emerges, it needs a MIME type. Um, so it, it's, actually, it, it's actually amazing what the standard has done for us. Um, so Nathaniel, um, what is MIME? Well, um, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll take that on. <laughs> um, mine, mine is actually, um, uh, there's basically three parts to MIME. And uh, they, they were sort of uh, uh, stimulated by three needs originally, but, and I can talk about those if you like. But the three main parts are a, um, a type system, and this is the most important part by far, is a type system um, by, by which you can label what type of data you have, and a, which comes with a registry uh, at the Internet Assigned Names Authority so that you can uh, register names and not have name conflicts. Um, there's a mechanism for encoding any data type in 7-bit ASCII, which is important for email, but not for much else. Um, and then there's a way of structuring multiple data parts, data types into a multi-part object, um, which is essentially an email and used by some other applications. But the core part that's used by the most pieces of the net is the uh, type name, structure, and registry. And that is um, uh, the primary way it was designed to be extended, and the measure of that is when we defined MIME, there were 16 types. As of last month, when I last checked, there were 1,309 types. So um, it's been, the most important thing about MIME is that it's a way to register a name for a data type so that when you send it to someone else, their software can decode it and do something uh, useful with it. Um, and, and is MIME... Uh, is MIME a standard that, that's sort of set in stone? Um, are the RFCs still being worked on, or is it pretty much done and it's cast in stone now? It's close to cast in stone. I mean, it's certainly um, not changing very much. Uh, it's, it's at the level of success where uh, you better hope everything's right because it's almost impossible to change. Um, my best estimate, I did some research and some stabs in the dark in preparation for this anniversary. My best estimate is that mine is used about a trillion times a day. Um, it's hard to change anything that's used a trillion times a day. Um, so fortunately, we don't seem to have made any, well, any really disastrous mistakes that need to be changed. And there are some things that we don't like about it that we might like to change, and it's not clear they ever will be. Yeah, uh, I mean, if we if we look at other standards that that have had to go through some evolution, like like the IP standard 
IPv4 to IPv6, that, that looks like it's going to be a painful transition. So moving something that's so widely in use is, uh, is no easy task. I want to... I, that's an example. That is the kind of transition that's so hard that it almost never happens. And in that particular case, there's such a driving need, which is running out of addresses, um, that people are trying very hard to make it happen. And it's tens of billions of dollars have been invested, and it's nowhere near done yet. So you know, barring that kind of a really deep, important, overwhelming need, it's not going to change. I just wanted to ask you, original MIME definition file, how many entries was actually in there? How many what? I'm sorry? How many the, entries? How many entries in the original MIME definition file? MIME types, you mean? Yes, yes. MIME types, d yeah. D uh, uh, there were 16. <laughs> <laughs> do, do, now, do you know them? 13. I'm sorry? Do you know them? I, I wonder if I can come up with all 16. Probably. I mean, do you want me to try? <laughs> <laughs> sure, shoot. How many? Well, there, there were seven original top level types. Okay. And then each of them had. Subtypes. So there was text, and we defined text plain and I think text rich text, which ended up falling into um, disuse in favor of HTML later. Um, there was image, JPEG, and GIF. Mm -hmm. So we're up to four. There was audio slash basic, um, which was basically a mu law encoded audio. Um, I don't think we did wave. That came pretty soon, though. If we found that away. Uh, under multipart, we had multipart mixed, which is the basic type, and multipart parallel, which is to show things in parallel, not much use, and multipart alternative, which is multiple versions of the same things. Uh, that's eight. We had video MPEG. We had message RFCA 22, message partial and message external body. I'm up to 12. I'm doing okay. <laughs> we had... Uh, we had application octet stream, which is the catch-all, sort of undifferentiated yeah. file. I think we had application postscript. I think that's 14. Yep. I may have to stop there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cool. All right. And now, how many mom types do you think is normally... I know it's a, it's a rough guess. No, you no, can no, 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 no. No, he's just told us. Did he? Yeah, 1,039. Yeah. No, as of last month, 1,309. Sorry, I mixed up my three and my nine. <laughs> so I, know my, my, I think it was, there's a very nice infographic with the guys have got it all done. Okay. I think it was done by Mime Cost. I'm not 100% sure. I know there's an infographic yeah. floating around, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, another thing um, that, that we've spoken about before and, and which you mentioned when you introduced yourself um, is your, your work in the, the content um, marketplace space, I, I, I want to say. Um, what was the name of that company? That was First Virtual Holdings. Um, it's, uh, for what it's worth, it's listed in the Smithsonian as the first internet payment system. Um, I'd rather be rich. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. And kind of, what kind of content did you sell that early in the days of the internet? First, let's, let's begin here. When, when did you start the company? Uh, 1994. And uh, it went live that same year because we built it very fast. We didn't sell anything. We enabled third-party sellers. And we focused on information commerce, selling bits. Okay. Um, and, and you're going to be stunned, shocked, and surprised to hear it. But the largest category of sellers from day one was, any guesses? Porn? Porn <laughs> yeah. Yay! <laughs> Prize for your home. <laughs> okay. Well, that explains a lot. That, well, they do say that that drives most of the internet technologies <laughs> um, forward. So I know video was a big thing driven by it. Uh, streaming was a big <laughs> thing driven by it. Um, and internet payment systems. It's not just the internet, though. I mean, if you look back at Gutenberg's printing press, everybody knows he started with the Bible. But I believe his third book was Erotica, the porn of the day. <laughs> um, well, it, was, it, it sells. Good old Chaucer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, basically, you know, human beings are fascinated by certain things, right? And, yeah, yeah. Uh, we all know. Um, <laughs> and actually, you know, uh, one of the more interesting parts of the first virtual experience for me um, was dealing with the porn sellers. Um, you know, I came away with some some interesting experiences and stories. Um, we were uh, in this business when the United States Congress passed the Communications Decency Act. And at that point, we had set up a store on which people could sell their products, and a lot of them were porn, and we were afraid that they'd go after us. So uh, in an attempt to be legal, 
we divided it between the adult half and the non-adult half. And the adult half, well, the store was called the Info House. And so we called the adult house the Info House of Ill Repute. Um, <laughs> and then uh, we made all the porn sellers go over there and we put a big sign on it, if you will, saying, don't, uh, don't come in here if you're under 21. Because we, we just wanted to be safe in all jurisdictions. And one of our biggest porn sellers wrote me a message saying, I've got a problem. <laughs> I can't access my own stuff according to your terms and conditions. <laughs> Uh, he was a, fun. He was a college student who convinced half the girls in his college to pose for him. That was amazing. Um, that sounds a like a good gig. Entrepreneur now. <laughs> that is like the way to make money at college. And then Facebook was born. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it wasn't quite the next step. Yeah, 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 yeah. The unfortunate thing with Facebook is your real name gets attached to that stuff. <laughs> yes. You don't it get depends who posts the picture. Yeah, you don't get to be Mindy or or, or Big Swing and Dan. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Not gonna um, ask questions. Yeah, <laughs> just <yeah>. go on. <laughs> now, 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 an interesting thing. The, the reason I actually really brought up the, the whole content marketplace thing is that. Um, one of our digital music stores in South Africa, we don't actually have a lot of, um, a lot of local digital content marketplaces, uh, A, and B, we don't have a lot of uh, interest from international guys um, to, to allow us to buy content digitally, digitally in South Africa. Among the, the, the sinners are Apple, uh, who don't give us access to iTunes, um, except, okay. uh, except for, for some apps, but nothing else. Google doesn't give us access to Google Music. Amazon doesn't give us access to, to anything but free apps on, on the App Store. We don't get MP3s. We do get some books, uh, yeah. uh, in fairness. Um, so and so, it was a little sad to see this this music store go down the drain. Um, it's O Music uh, by DSTV. Um, uh, it, are you seeing any trends um, in this space? Are, are you even looking at the space in, in with with those kinds of eyes um, to to sort of see where things are going? Uh, is, is it going to peter out and die? Is something going to supplant it? Well, um, I don't know what exactly is going on in South Africa. Are there sure. legal constraints that are making them shy of yeah. doing business in South Africa? Um, some say okay. uh, some say so, but when we but when we take it on from a legal perspective, then we get we, then we say that no, 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 it's really just a content distribution deal thing. So basically, because Nokia, for example, who who are an, an international company, they sell music digitally in South Africa, and from the feedback they gave me, it's really just a matter of doing the legwork and getting the the, the the distribution agreements in place with all the local players. Um, well, you know, some of it may be sort of the balance between the effort involved, as you described, the legwork, um, and the size of the market. You know, if you're if you're Apple or Amazon and making sales in those quantities and growing fast, you know, you you, you may not be ready to commit the effort. You know, it may just be that uh, it seems like diminishing returns. I don't know. Um, I find the whole legal situation around digital, um, digital goods to be just deplorable. Um, we have the easiest form of distribution in the history of the world. We have absolutely frictionless, nearly cost-free distribution, and we're going out of our way to make it hard for people. Um, it's, it's just, a, to me, it's, it's almost an obscenity. Um, by the way, the way first virtual worked, um, I said we designed it for virtual goods, you know, for digital goods. Um, our premise was, if you're a merchant and you're at all reputable, if a customer comes back to you with what he bought and says, I'm unhappy, you'll give him a refund. That's almost universal in this day and age. But if it's a digital good, you don't want the merchandise back. So what we said is, basically, um, you get the goods and then you say yes or no to paying for it. Um, and you can say that's a version of the honor system, but the fact is, the, something like 99% of people pay for everything. Um, and it, uh, by doing it that way, you, you eliminated all customer service problems. You just made the whole thing really frictionless. Mm. Um, it was very popular with the um, small sellers that used our system, um, and it scared the daylights out of the big content providers who assumed everyone would rip them off. They just assumed the, the worst about people. Though I, I know, so, if, yeah. I, d d um, <laughs> how how did you guys actually find it when you're selling it? Did you actually find that it actually worked quite well? Because I know a lot of these subsequent studies have actually found that those methods, the, the ones you uh, were trying to work with, actually does apparently work very well. Yeah, we had 
just, I, you know, we figured it would work based on sort of an optimistic view of human nature, but it worked way better than we expected. Um, hardly anybody said no. And of course we had some mechanisms so that somebody who always bought things and always said no would have been booted off the system. I don't think they were ever used. And we, you know, this system wasn't just a toy system. At one point, we were growing so fast that I figured we'd have, uh, if we kept it up, we'd have everyone on the planet within 14 months. Um, you know, we had hundreds of thousands of users back in the day, which was a lot for the Internet at that stage. Um, so, you know, I think it was enough to be confident that we knew how it was going to work. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's just, there's no trust. There's no, there's, there's no, the big companies don't trust people even when they're likely to be trustworthy. It's very interesting about that. Mm. Well, you see that quite a bit with all the other things going on now. With the other, the, because this piracy thing is something that keeps on cropping its head up and they keep on trying to stop it in one way or another. But it, it generally keeps on going. And then generally when you actually find somebody does, I know Apple with the music in America, um, that cut down piracy as soon as people could get it a lot easier. So it's always interesting. The key is making it easy to pay and making the pricing reasonable. Yeah. If the price is... You know, it's something that people consider reasonable, and all you have to do is essentially click a button to pay. The vast majority of people will pay, and the people who don't are the same people who are shoplifting in music stores anyway. I mean, they're not your paying customers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a good thing, but not many. Mm. Um, uh, do you guys have more questions on this topic? Oh. I would like to ask you about Mimecast a little bit as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, cool. Before we ask about Mimecast, okay, maybe do Mimecast, and I'm gonna, I've got one final question uh, maybe afterwards. All right, sure. Um, I, I did want to ask a little bit about Mimecast, and and um, if, if the name Mimecast is derived from, you know, your original standard, and if that's why you joined them, um, and, and a little bit about what Mimecast does. Okay, I'll start with the name just because... That I can get it out of the way with. Um, I believe that the best advice I ever got in my whole career was when I was working on what became the MIME standard, and it was starting to look like it would work, and Dave Crocker, who was the author of the original Internet Mail Standards, took me aside and said, I have a bit of advice for you. Come up with a catchy name. And I laughed, and I said, yeah, that makes a big difference. And he said, no, having a, having a name that people remember makes a huge difference, and he gave me some examples. And so I thought of it for about 15 minutes and came up with multi-purpose internet mail extensions. And I'm convinced that was the most productive 15 minutes of my career, because <laughs> when you have a name to hook something on, um, people remember it. So you, know, it, you, you, you start this out by saying, we have with us the author of the mind standard. If you had said, we have with us the author of RFC 1341, nobody would have had a clue, right? <laughs> And, and there's lots of you know, important standards out there that don't have a catchy name and nobody knows anything. So it's been really good for my career that it had such a catchy name. Now, as I understand it, the founders of Mimecast named the company Mimecast because mine had to do with mail and it was a mail services company. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I wasn't involved. And when I was looking for another job, my first reaction on hearing about Mimecast was basically, you know, can they do that? <laughs> you know, and then, you know, it was... If anything, it was a negative because I knew I would get this question over and over. <laughs> but uh, you know, I had nothing to do with the founding of the company, um, but they certainly didn't mind having the author of mine join Mindcast. Um, now, what does Mindcast do? Um, we do um, what we call unified email management in the cloud. And what that means is all of the um, auxiliary things around the email, sort of besides running your basic exchange or domino or whatever server, Um, We do in the cloud, and we make it possible for uh, business customers to get um, better quality of service at lower costs, and in some cases with fewer admins. Um, So, for example, we do the usual security and antivirus stuff. We we do a a very serious business of archiving and compliance and uh, um, continuity. So, for example, when there was the big outage last year in Blackberries, um, our customers didn't even know about it. They just kept working. Um, uh, and essentially, our customers just have a, a mail service that is reliable without them having to do a lot. And that's, that's the heart of our business, especially the archiving, um, which is our bread and butter. But looking forward, we believe that once you have an archive of a business's email, um, which by some measures has over 80% of a business's information out, um, you can start to do some really interesting things with deep analytics. 
And that's an area we're looking at over the next uh, few months and year or two. Cool. Could you see the cops yeah. going faster? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Cool. Um, I, I saw that, that you guys managed to survive the BlackBerry thing. I'm just checking on, on a technical level. Does that work? So you guys pre- sort of run your own, so the BlackBerry's actually connect to you? Or how did you guys survive that? Um, yeah, we have a server they talk to directly. Um, okay. And sort of, you, you can go both ways, but it'll go, it'll go, I mean, the BlackBerry app that knows what to do. So, you know, you download our app and uh, it knows when to talk to our server. Okay, cool. um, and uh, I, I wanted to ask just also um, uh, about the mail servers that you run. So you mentioned Exchange and stuff. Um, can do, do do you offer um, uh, a customer any any type of uh, mail server? Can they choose, or or do you run on a particular uh, type of technology? Well, we don't actually run the mail server. Um, we do everything but run the mail server. So a typical customer will either run their Exchange server, the most common. Um, or their you know, Domino or IMAP server, and everything else we'll take care of. We will you know, route the mail in and out to them for archiving purposes and for security purposes. Um, we will put various things in that um, cause their servers to communicate more directly to us. Um, but we are agnostic about, we're agnostic but more experienced in expecting exchange. Um, and uh, the, the, the customers that want to completely outsource everything, there are plenty of people that do hosted exchange. It's it's almost a commodity business, mm-hmm. which is why we're not in it. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Was there any other questions with you wanted to ask? Several hosts of it. Uh, no, I've got. I'm done. All right. Okay. My question was so much yes. more Um I just see you've, you, through your career, have started several internet companies or been involved in several. I was just wondering, was there anything you've learned through that in starting up internet startups or being involved or, or starting up companies? Because uh, I can see now currently you've joined a, a company that I know you didn't start. But what, what advice or what experiences have you had through that? Uh, I, I'd say the most important things I've learned is that most individuals are trustworthy and most companies are not. <coughs> um, so, you know, I, I've done some things over the years um, um, where uh, uh, I, I have often talked to someone and asked them, um, would you be willing to sign an NDA? And if they said yes, I'll talk to you now. And I would talk with them about something that wasn't really all that sensitive. And then later ask them to sign the NDA. You know, so sort of having made a gesture of trust. Only once did anybody ever refuse to sign that NDA after the fact. And I never disclosed anything all that important. It was more about mm. you know, learning something about the person. But uh, only once did that ever happen. I'm not going to name a name, but very well-known internet personality. Um, on the other hand, um, I have seen companies behave uh, unethically more often than not. Okay. okay. And uh, someday, like someday, I'll write up the stories, but I don't want to make any any enemies <laughs> worse. <laughs> so, no, I understand that. Yeah, your memoirs. Um, now, now talking talking about the internet. Um, uh, I mean, this, I don't know if this directly, this really directly impacts you, but but we are seeing a a lot of. Um, uh, and, you know, the Internet's almost become a bit of a battleground. Uh, I, I mean, in, in email terms, we've got spam and, and email being used to deliver viruses, um, uh, you know, and, and viruses now being used uh, in, in cyber warfare. Um, but uh, uh, on the other hand, we've also got governments, uh, you, know, trying, you know, trying their luck, I, I would say, you know, to... To, to try and get some more regulation in there. Now, I don't, you know, feel free to not comment, but I have to ask. Um, with, with things like SOPA and PIPA and ACTA, um, uh, do you have a, do you have a, a view on that? Uh, are, you, are you outspoken about that uh, at all? Well, on, on, on uh, SOPA and PIPA, um, I was one of the signatories. You might remember there was a, uh, uh, a letter that a bunch of... Uh, uh, Internet old hands, or I don't remember what they call them, wrote, and I was one of the signatories to that. So I certainly um, felt strongly about that. I, I for many years, was very active in uh, computer professionals for social responsibility, and we took on uh, uh, issues like that all the time. I was on the board for years, and for a little while I was the president. Um, those, uh, those battles are, are very frustrating. Um, pe- most people don't understand the issues. And the bad guys, as I would construe them, take advantage of that fact. And, you know, we won the SOPA-PIPA battle 
not because everybody understood it going in, but because sites like uh, like Wikipedia made a very public stand and an oversimpl- oversimplified explanation of what they were taking a stand about, and you know they caused people who depended on them to to write their Congress people. Right? It was uh, it was um, as much a sign of the power of certain large internet companies as it was a sign of you know people taking responsibility for a free and open internet. And you know, yeah, Google did the right thing in that one. They're a big company. Wikipedia did the right thing in that one. They're a nonprofit, but it's still being accomplished by these big actors, which is a little scary because you can't always act. You can't always assume their interest is going to correspond with ours. Yes, yes. Um, what we have seen to contrast that point, though, is what. Uh, now, now, correct me if I'm wrong, but it appears to be smaller players um, launching this Coney 2012 campaign and sort of encouraging people to share the video, for good or bad. Um, I don't know if you've come across the, the Kony 2012 video at all? No, I have not, actually. Okay. Um, so maybe it's not as effective as I thought it was, but um, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's basically a, a, social, um, a social awareness campaign driven by a YouTube video about a uh, warlord in Central Africa called Joseph Kony. Um, and uh, it's it's a call to it's a call to action for you know uh, uh, there's a little bit of, of armchair activism in there um, but really the idea is to is to get this guy's name out there to to drive awareness because nobody knows about about this guy or or what he's doing all right but uh, I think I think the point is proven there that the big guys are certainly more effective at getting the message out there than than smaller social uh, you know smaller guys trying to use social networks to 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 get the message out there. Well, I would- I wouldn't read too much into my not having seen it. I mean, I don't see everything on the internet, right? Um, much though I might like to. Um, I do think that the internet is the most powerful tool we've ever had for positive social change. I just think that um, it's it's just as good a tool for negative social change, and, and some of the negative forces have have mastered it faster. Mm-hmm. Um, cool. You can get examples on both sides. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Nathaniel, thank you very much. Um, I, we're going we're gonna to move into other topics uh, uh, for the moment. Um, so feel free to chime in at any point. Yeah, cool. Uh, okay, we're going to remove a couple of... So, uh, well, we'll move some stuff over for next week's show. It's going to be yes. a great show next week, guys. <laughs> we'll get lots of topics. <laughs> yes. Cool. I uh, just wanted to look, the first thing I wanted to actually just bring in quite quickly, just as we are going quickly now, opposition for, of Urban Tolling Alliance. <clears throat> and, uh, on purpose, but that abbreviates to OTA which can, may or may not be seen as a, as, a derogatory, as a derogatory word. I don't think it's that derogatory, but p- people should be aware of these things before they choose the acronym. Um, so it's, an, of, it's an Afrikaans okay, word. Sorry, it's an Afrikaans word. I'm sitting going, <laughs> it is? What? Yeah, yeah. The best way to explain it is an elderly black person uh, so um, it, it's, it's usually referred to as the person who's looking after the landlord's holding. Okay. He's, he's, the, he's the guy in charge, the OTA. Uh, but uh, it can be seen as, as derogatory. Anyway, bad, so, yeah, bad choice. so, so they've, they've launched a, a website against the, the tolling of the freeways uh, in Gauteng. And there's also another a group, uh, tollfreegp.co.za, who have launched a website to the same effect. Look, I would say just go check them out. Um, I must say, I still need to look into this. I've been quite bad. I, I've just suddenly realized, found out now, you, you have to sign up if you live in Gauteng. Don't have to. It, Don't take the highway. It, it, ain't, it, ain't, it ain't over to the fat lady sings. Yeah, that's just it. Fat so lady I, has not I, I need to actually catch myself up a bit on this. The gov- the, the, uh, the to to, catch, people, to catch people up who, who might have been busy at work like you, yeah. the government is threatening, it's ridiculous, criminal action against people who do not pay their tolls as in, uh, in civil disobedience uh, mm-hmm. to, to, this, to this system. Um, uh, they're also um, saying that they're going to use the licensing department's systems uh, to basically force people to pay their, to pay their tolls. So the, um, uh, that's cool. If the next time I start a company, I want to run my billing through the traffic department. What, what um, I found more, just uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, is that apparently they're now f- almost forcing us to get e-tags. No, that's the idea. They want to force you to, or not force you to get an e-tag, at least force you, because if you do not pay your toll, you will not be able to re- renew your license. That's a tack they're taking. But the okay. AA and all these organizations are warning people, it really still needs to be fleshed out still. It needs to be fought out. Um, it's not been... It's not been uh, discussed by the relevant people enough. 
Um, so there's, uh, there, there could still be a long road yet. Or the She's government the could come down on us like a ton of bricks. We'll see what happens. Okay. But anyway, go start checking the sites. I know I've scheduled it this weekend. I'm going to sit down and actually catch myself up because it goes live at the end of this month. Yeah. Then in, uh, a very interesting story, um, uh, end, of, uh, no, end of April. Uh, sorry, 30th of April, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, okay. So I've got yeah, yeah. a bit more time. I'll just right. have to double check that. But yeah. Okay. And, um, uh, so a very interesting story that came out today was that they are using an ion cannon called the Hyperion to create solar panels. And they say they can do it more cost effectively than solar panels are now uh, manufactured in China for. Um, so, um, quite impressive. Uh, yeah, uh, the information I've not been able to retrieve yet, so maybe we'll do a follow up uh, in a later show. And yeah. this brings the big thing because the main problem from our understanding with solar power, okay, there are two major problems. First one is battery. Batteries, uh, yeah. And cost to produce power. And it's, yeah, but, but the cost to produce power comes down to efficiency. So that's what I wanted to ask, and that's information I couldn't, um, I couldn't find. Is, uh, I mean, uh, I don't think they've improved the efficiency of solar power at all. Um, does, what is the lifespan of, of this panel? And will it generate more electricity than it actually costs to make? Because of, I, I speak on a correction, but that is still a challenge in well, solar I, power. I know the biggest thing is apparently this thing reduces the cost to produce. Uh, reduces produce. the cost to produce, but that doesn't, that doesn't speak to the energy inputs um, necessarily. They, did th uh, they use an ion cannon. I, I have to reread through this properly. Uh, <laughs> but they did say that it actually makes it affordable to use solar powers. Solar yes, panels. affordable, but that doesn't mean that it's actually power efficient. Electrical efficiency is different from money input. Electrical efficiency comes down to, can the solar panel physically produce the energy it took to produce it? I, I'm going to have to. I remember uh, the same I quote about well. it, you could, running the, your, your car off this would be cheaper than using petrol. Yes. I remember that, that quote. That's, that's one aspect now, of it. Now, is that including the price of buying the solar panel? Uh well, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, anyway, I, I we need so. to. We will do more research. What we'll, yeah, yeah. we'll fully end so up. So there's with more, more that time. we don't know there that than that, that we do know. I just know. want to know. Yes, this is like a cannon, so it goes boom when you've got a solar panel. <laughs> No, no. Oh, no, I'm just asking that question. That I mean, would be awesome. I mean, that would be like, boom, you got a solar panel. Pretty much what they're doing is they're um, bombarding solar panels that have been prefabricated with uh, ions. Ions. Okay. Which then basically embed themselves inside, the, uh, just go read the article just to make sure, embed themselves inside the, the wafer. So bang as, doesn't go As time theory. goes by, the, those ions expand again into hydrogen atoms again and basically a way of getting hydrogen inside the solar panel cheaply and before this uh, the only way to do this would be with an accelerator which are quite expensive so okay. they found a cheaper way of get doing this okay. uh, now just go please go reread this this is read as a layman quickly uh, trying to understand what they're doing um, but that, that's pretty which is pretty cool that it is just the <coughs> coolest way I've ever heard of a solar panel being produced, and it would be really, really awesome if it's moved solar energy into into a zone where it can do no, what uh, you said. where it's more than a checkbox. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So um, cool. Uh, uh, the the other the other uh, big thing that came out this week was Vodacom warning its users that they might sue them if they transfer files downloaded over their BlackBerry connection onto their BlackBerry onto their PC. Yes, because that is against the terms and conditions of sorry, the BlackBerry Internet Service. Vodacom. Vodacom. Oh, oh, sorry, did we speak about them already tonight? <laughs> so let's just move along. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the, the reason for this, and it's and it's sort of a blanket. It's 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 a blanket thing, which is with the way governments make laws. Let's not go there. <laughs> but um, what they're trying to cut down on, for those of you who have not followed the saga, is you have a top tier of users. We're talking a handful, uh, under ten users who use. Have misused uh, hundreds yeah. of gigabytes of manual for your benefit. That is less than ten dollars uh, for an uncapped uh, internet connection, um, and they then, and they cruise it over three hundred uncapped gigs. wireless internet. Connection. Yes, uncapped mobile internet connection. My question with this: there must be a technical way to stop this. There has to. Be. They are working on it. My my understanding is um, is that research in motion. Um, locks it down. You are not able to inspect what is going on over that connection because a research in motion owns that and they will not let you look. It's a security precaution. So they will not even let the network look at what, that, what is happening. That's there. fine. I don't mind that. But there must be a way for vertical to go to research in motion. They've done that. 
Um, Stop it. Yes, they've done that. They are working on a solution. I don't know what that means. Or uh, they're be talking to RIM. They're talking to Google. No, no, no. Make, Everything's make, in process. No, 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 look, make no mistake. Vodacom has spoken to RIM. I don't know about Google, uh, but but they have spoken uh, okay, to RIM. So I do what not they, know how far along okay, that solution is. Okay, so what are they trying to do with this statement? They're trying to scare those people yes. if they stop on their own. Yes. Yes. Okay, let's hope it works. Yeah. Moving along. And, and, and to give fair warning. So now, um, so they've updated the T's and C's, plus Vodacom have said... They have updated the T's and C's, but it's not saying anything now that it hasn't said before. It's just in clearer language now. Okay. Um, so uh, 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 that's what they say. <laughs> I'm going to leave it at that. Um, is this not the response to the previous debacle where they said nobody may download more, more than, than 100 megs? They've got a back, lot of negative press, and this is their new press statement too. Well, how's this <laughs> less negative? But yes. Uh, in their heads, they thought, well, they're not going to mind this one No, so no, 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 no. Uh, make no mistake. We made 100% sure that they were cool with this type of communication going out. Okay. And so <laughs> so um, this is – and so this is now fair warning to those abusers. <laughs> Uh, that um, you know that that Vodacom is taking it seriously. So I don't think Vodacom is going to go after somebody who downloads a picture off WhatsApp no. or BBM no. and moves it onto their PC. Plus, they won't really know. It's um, not cost effective. Yes, to, you're to going go to after find the guy that's downloaded 100 gigs and you're yeah. going to go. I mean, that, what that are you does, doing? Uh, to, in my, to my mind, that doesn't excuse making a blanket you know law or regulation for something. Um, so, but the you know be that as it may, this is where it's at. So let's get. This one. What did you want to talk about? Uh, we don't know what you're talking about. We don't know what the you're kicker. talking about. Go to the kicker. Oh, yeah, we're right. going Look to the kicker. This. NewYorkJedi.com. You must be kidding me. Yeah, it's fantastic. So I'm going to put the link in the IRC um, for, for everybody who wants to watch. It's going to be in the show notes. Your own Jedi club. Yes. So uh, it's, uh, there's a guy who started a, a Jedi Academy in New a, York. A real life. A oh, real right. life a real Jedi life Academy. academy. Um, so for those of you on the video, you will see people practicing with lightsabers. He has um, merged uh, various various uh, th uh, theologies and mantras and whatever. So he's got, he's got the canon from Star Wars merged with martial arts, uh, merged with what I think is Taoist Buddhism, uh, I think there's Tibetan also Buddhism. My, maybe my a mistake. bit of a kiddo in there with a the sword play. Yes. So the, the, he said, I think he just said martial arts, but I think he meant uh, as well. Or kendo, sorry. Yes. yes. I'm thinking kendo. No. You can see, especially the guy on the far right there. He's definitely a very kendo outfit. Yes. For, for those of you who can't see, the, uh, can't see the video, who are watching the audio, we are looking at a screen of seven uh, Jedi, one of them dressed up as Darth Maul. This is, this is like a merger of a dojo and a cosplay. And apparently doing quite well. If I ever live in New York, I'm signing up. Stop one here. <laughs> uh, all that free time. Yeah. I, I think South Africans have other other concerns at this stage. Uh, that's, that's just yeah. That's brilliant. I love it. Nicely done. Oh, look at one of these ads at the bottom. The custom saber shop dot com. Uh, this looks like this. Yeah, this site could become interesting. Indeed. indeed. Playtime reading. <laughs> that brings us to the end of our show. Cool. It's just Thank our guests. Yeah, we will now. Uh, thank you for joining us. Nathaniel, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Right. Um, and can, can you tell people uh, where they can reach you on Twitter? Do you have a blog? Do you have a website? Uh, all of the above. Um, any, I, the easiest way is just NSB, as in no such baby, at mindcast.com. Very cool. Great. Um, and, uh, and your website and your Twitter handle will be in our, uh, will be in our show notes. Um, thank you so much again for joining us. Good. Pleasure. A lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah, we right. really enjoyed it. And where can they find you? Uh, they can find me on the Twitface at JanVZA. Uh, I'm also on Google+. Plus. You can search my name, Jan Vermeulen. I'm on there. Circle me. Put me in the like lame people I follow and then that gives me like an extra thing to my cloud score um, and I don't have a circle by that name you should create one well, I'll create one <laughs> and I don't want to ask you what circle <laughs> I'm using <laughs> and uh, family, friends, acquaintances Google and other I think mm -hmm. cool no, so and it's not too bad. I also write for my broadband my broadband .co .za. stop right now. yep blog dot who else dot co .za. Uh, myself, you can find Tim underscore Hawk and then here on the Let's Talk Network. Aren't you on Google Plus? I am actually, yes. I, I, just, I have had no time to be on Facebook or Google Plus you know, at all. You're more past. of a follower than a, than a producer there. Oh, oh well, it's just time. Yes, I'm yes. not even on Facebook. I'm on none of them. 
Twitter, okay. But Twitter is like email. It it's like there and open. You can constantly check it. Yeah. Yes. Uh, to the point of actually removed the Facebook client and Google Plus client off my phone. Just just s- you using an Android phone thing? without a Google Plus client. Yes. File sale, awesome. found and child worship and heathen no, devil. See, that's why I like and- Android. I can do it. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much for joining us, everybody. Uh, do check out our other shows. Uh, we, we're on YouTube. We've got the streams up on we the website. Go like us on Facebook, Twitter, and Google+. Plus. <laughs> Circle us on Google+. And Plus. YouTube. Oh, yeah. You can friend Subscribe. people on YouTube. Yeah. Oh, that thing. Cool. Right. Thank you for watching. <laughs>